Zoom recording. Okay. And Commissioner Marcella. And Commissioner Fiedler. Here. Great. Um, um, any known changes or additions to the You didn't get a response from Marcella, is that right? Correct. Anne is having trouble getting on. Okay. Uh, I know Kayla's planning on being here. Okay. Um, we did not end up with the minutes, right, for September 13th? No, I'm sorry. No worries. So we'll table those. Uh, moves us down to our old business items. First one on the agenda is file 21-24, which is the LDC Emergency Facility Code Amendment that was tabled from our last meeting on September 13th. And, and do we... Go ahead. I was just going to say if you wanted to present that or if we wanted to give Ann a minute to try to log on. Well, I think that um, we the reason that you had um, tabled this was to be able to get some uh, legal interpretations or, or legal thoughts. Is that still the case? Yes. I think we were, I think there was just some... Uh, feelings of comfort in having our uh, Lake County Council take a look at the um, verbiage that would be used um, to not only apply towards Angel View, but to, you know, our code as a whole. Yes. Um, I think maybe, um, I hate to do this to you, Chris, but do you have any thoughts that you'd like to give us in lieu of Anne being? I don't know that I'm in a position to present in lieu of Ann. Um, I know that in terms of looking at what is proposed, um, you know, I think there is, uh, there's some concern as to whether the proposed code amendment um, actually meets all the criteria for the code amendment still. And so I think that the plan was to uh, hopefully have the, um, applicants and uh, his or, or their counsel uh, present more information along that line. Yeah, I, I, I guess um, since Ann is still having trouble, I'm getting texts and so are you, Heather, um, from uh, Ann about her difficulties in getting on. She should be here very shortly. But I think one of the things that we might want to ask the applicant to, to do is to explain their, their thinking that this is consistent with the goals, objectives, policies, uh, and other provisions of the Lake Country, Co County Comprehensive Plan. I'd like to probably hear that from your mouths. Well, and I guess before, before we go there, I guess I would assume, and correct me if I'm wrong, that they made application thinking that they were meeting those guidelines. So um, not having what we're objecting to is a little bit difficult um, in just opening up an, an, a, a conversation on, oh, Anne looks like she's jumping on here. Um, hey, Anne. Hey, sorry about that. Okay, thanks. Hey, so we were just talking quickly about item, uh, the first one on the agenda about the emergency services facilities. Um, Chris gave us kind of just a brief understanding that there were some questions as to whether or not the current proposed application um, meets all of the criteria to conform with the LDC right now. Is that in, in what... I guess what items do we want to be um, reviewing this evening with the applicant um, in that manner? Um, so I think I think the understanding, um, uh, and I apologize, I, I wasn't uh, didn't wasn't able to finish the last meeting with you, but I think that there was just as we look at this code amendment and recognizing that it's a countywide amendment, 
um, recognizing, you know, what the impact is, uh, not just, uh, you know, not identifying it not as a singular uh, situation, but how does it fit in and does it make sense countywide? And really kind of um, identifying within it that what it does is create an opportunity on tracts of, of land and not just where normal uses are contemplated, um, where on legal conforming lots. So um, is a civic institutional use, um, and I'm so sorry about my background noise, um, is um, does it make sense to create this uh, under the, the site specific standards in, um, in our code uh, for consideration countywide? And I think that um, the outcome of our last discussion was it would be good to have legal review that and just make sure that we don't have any unintended consequences in, in looking at this countywide and does it really serve a, a benefit um, to and strengthen the existing code. So I, I, that is what I believe was our intent is, is to look at this in a little more focused countywide uh, consideration. And, and so I guess what, what is the update since the last meeting? Has county attorney been able to review that and give their um, recommendation? And I know Chris kind of alluded a little bit to this, but I think that's where we're at right now is. Right, I think that um, she and I uh, had a, a, some comment back and forth and, and um, but I think largely I, I didn't, wasn't effective in communicating maybe the intent of, of what we were looking for review wise. And um, so I don't know if Chris feels comfortable um, commenting at all right now, or, um, you know, if there's, uh, so I guess first I would ask, uh, Chris, do you have anything to maybe add to the discussion currently? Well, and at, I was waiting, and as you were having challenges logging on, waiting for you to join the, the conversation, because I know part of the, the communications that Ann and I exchanged had to do with the specific nature of the code exemption or, or amendment, and as Ann mentioned, how it may impact countywide. And I guess the question becomes, not really feeling, based on everything I've reviewed that's been submitted, feeling that... I'm not sure that we have had we have enough information to support the need for the code amendment is is kind of what I'm focusing on. And so uh, and because of the fact that it's it's a code amendment that will be countywide and such it, you know, that's what I was looking for was more information as to the need for the code amendment. Um, Heather, would you like the um, uh, proponent, um, the applicant, to kind of speak to maybe their thoughts about that, or did you? Would you like staff to respond? Yeah, no, I think that that's kind of what we were looking for. Was um, you know, kind of what we're asking from the proponent, and then get a response. Um, I see Commissioner Much has her hand up, though. Sorry, if I could add, and I'm uh, sorry about not being able to actually raise my Zoom hand. Um, I, I think my question specifically on whether or not this warrants um, a code amendment is kind of back, backs up to, um, you know, a whole process uh, similar to what we have been through with Fire Station 2, say, and, and identifying a clear gap and then responding to that gap. And as the county under currently under construction for fire station two and an emergency facility. Um, I think my, I don't have clarity on then outside of that and beyond that construction and, and services that that facility will provide to the community. How do we know that there are these other gaps that are not being met or will not be met? Um, and, and, you know, the county has not identified um, other areas where we would need to make some of these exceptions to code in allowing um, a use that is not currently allowed. So the, the amendment wouldn't, uh, oh, it would incorporate locations uh, site specific, but the use would remain um, uh, conditional within the, the areas that it's allowed. And I think as a use by right in the CI. 
Um, so what it would do, I think the, the basis of what the code would, amendment would do on a countywide basis is create standards by which um, all applications would be equally vetted. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop talking for a minute and try and get my background noise under control. Sorry. So I think Sarah, where she was going with that was just that the current the proposed the proposed code amendment um, wouldn't necessarily change that the use is allowed and it isn't now um, because I believe that it would remain conditional regardless of the scenario, but more so I think the, the, the main just and somebody correct me if I'm wrong is about whether it's tracked or lot specific and allows for smaller parcels to be considered for it. Um, but I will at this moment pass it on to the applicant to go ahead and address all of the things that are being said right now. <laughs> And I don't know who wants to speak on behalf of the applicant. I know we have Mr. Johnson, Elias, and Ms. Kendrick on here. Uh, this, this is Bart, if it's okay, I'll start. And then Alan or Melissa can jump in if they want to augment what I, what I say or, or correct me if I've gotten something wrong. Um, I guess I'll start with Sarah's last comment, Commissioner Mudge, if that makes sense about the, the not sure about the need for a, a new facility in a particular location in the county right now for emergency services. Um, you know, th this isn't a proposal for a specific facility at this point. Um, it's to create opportunity for that in the future and to create a process by which it could be evaluated with more meat on the bone than the county's current process. Um, and then we need to jump to, I think, another important point is that, yes, the proposed language does create more options as to where these facilities could be located in that it specifies they could be either on a lot or a tract and that the, the size of the parcel could be evaluated as appropriate at that time and there would be some flexibility in sizing as far as land area. So in that case, in that way, it, it does create more flexibility, but it also gives the county more tools to evaluate these, understanding that in every zone district except CI, they are conditional uses, which means people would have to go through a process of applying for them and having some you know, site-specific evaluation. And your code does have generic conditional use provisions. But the benefit of this code amendment would be to create uh, a, a, a list of criteria or cri that would be evaluated that are really specific to emergency services and would help the county evaluate an application in the future if one were to be made um, and probably provide more guidance than the code provided in the South Station circumstance. Um, because in it, it, as far as your comprehensive plan, it would help fulfill some of the aspirations of that plan by placing a greater emphasis on making sure there's good access to the facility, making sure that it's in harmony with neighboring uses, that it's got adequate utilities, that it, the type of, the, the specific type of emergency services um, are needed. Uh, in that particular area and that it's an appropriate location for it, things of that nature. So that's what we've tried to do is, yes, create more flexibility, but also arm the county with more kind of precise code provisions that would help it evaluate one of these conditional use applications if they ever came in. Thank you for that clarification. I, maybe I'll add to that briefly. And I know this is being said, but I want it to be really clear that your code right now allows safety service facilities. It's in your code, but it doesn't give you any direction as decision makers on how do you cite those services? 
you know, you have the conditional use permit, which Bart, as Bart pointed out, is generic, but it's these are specific standards. So we help you define what a safety service facility is, and then provide some direction to you on, on where they would be located and what kinds of utilities, what kinds of access, you know, these really critical items that right now you don't have any tools. Um, we're providing you with tools. And this would be true, it's, you know, it could, it will, could be true at uh, Angel View, but it, it could be true anywhere that you have a any kind of emergency service facility. So that's that's the basis. I think our, the, our application addresses the criteria um, to Chris Floyd's um, uh, point. You know, have we met the criteria for a code amendment? And we address the the and it has been stated that the comp plan considers public safety as a key component. And so this helps strengthen um, your public safety facilities. Um, it, it addresses, are there any changes in the community in terms of social values or new planning concepts or economic conditions? And so this amendment helps to solidify um, a use like this um, where the zoning doesn't specifically give you direction. So it addresses it in that way. And then finally, public health, safety, and welfare. You know, clearly having the right public safety facilities in the right locations is critical and that they have the, you know, the infrastructure available to support them. So those were the three areas um, addressing specific criteria that we um, articulated in our application. And, and I think it goes to the question of, have we met the criteria? So that's all I have, Commissioner. Okay, thank you. Uh, staff, council, commissioners, anybody have anything additional they wanna add or ask or? Well, the, the one thing I was gonna mention is, you know, the, I have, a, I reviewed the staff report that Ann provided and, and such and, um, yeah, the, the excerpts from the application, I, mean, I don't have the, the full application that was submitted for the code amendment, but the, the excerpts as to how the applicant meets each of the criteria are pretty much what Ms. Kendrick just said. But I, I think what, what I was alluding to before is the specific examples of how this isn't being met now, why there's a need for this code amendment, what has precipitated the request for the code amendment besides essentially the rephrasing of what the criteria are. Um, and that's, I was looking for more specific, you know, um, you know, analogies or something to, to, to essentially drive why the code amendment is needed. Not, not debating that it might be a good thing, but just something that the commissioners, both the planning commission and the board of county commissioners need to have something substantive to establish why they're approving or denying the, the code amendment that's been requested. I can answer that, if it would make sense, or at least I can take a shot at it. Um, it, it obviously, th this code amendment proposal was precipitated by one particular project, that's the Angel View project that's in a separate subdivision application, but it's, Kind of impossible to look at this and completely ignore that and it and there were a, a couple of reasons why this code amendment became a good idea in our minds as the applicant one is there was some desire to have a safety services facility in the project um, that would be some type of public facility but that and it is allowed as a conditional use in the zone district, but that there's no definition for it in your code. So trying to understand what might be permitted and how that might look was kind of problematic because it's got a use with no definition. Uh, so we thought having an amendment to the code that actually defined what a safety services facility is would be a good, good idea, particularly when it comes to things like making clear that it would allow for overnight accommodations for people staff there. 
if necessary, um, that could allow for the storage of equipment and vehicles. And, and the, the reason phrases like that are important is because we don't know exactly what this facility might look like. We don't know if it will ever come to fruition. Alan very much hopes it will, but there have been different concepts bandied about, including boat storage for a boat that could be used for emergency services on the lake, uh, for um, mountain rescue equipment that could be staged there or stored there, which it may not fit within most people's conventional idea of, because people just tend to think of this as a firehouse, but it could be some combination of different things, but none of that was defined in the code. So we, we took a shot at creating a definition that we thought worked well. Um, it, is, it, is it tailored a little bit to what Alan has in mind for Angel Boo? Of course, because we wrote it, but it, 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 not in a cynical way. We're just trying to, to create specificity where there is none now. Um, and in some cases, we're also trying to create flexibility where there isn't much now. Um, and that was another need that we saw. Um, right now, under your code, you probably couldn't put an emergency facility like this, even pub a publicly owned one, one given to the public on a tract within a, within a subdivision. Um, but there's not any magic reason why that shouldn't be permitted if it makes sense from a policy perspective. And so we thought if we had appropriate site selection criteria that could be evaluated as part of that conditional use application, then it may make sense to allow a facility like this to be on a tract within a subdivision that isn't meeting the three acre lot size, but that still makes sense for the facility for the greater good. It just and if, if that can be borne out in a conditional use process, then why not permit it? We're talking about you know, something that, that serves the public. Let's not get hung up on whether it's a three acre lot or a two and a half acre tract or, you know, so we wanted to create that kind of flexibility. So those, those, were, those are a couple of examples of specific needs we found kind of lacking in the current code and what that we tried to address through this amendment process. Um, uh, Madam Chair, may I speak, ask a question? I think that um, Heather's question about, I, I wonder if you could provide us with a description of the difference between a lot and a tract <clears throat> and um, how it is that this is being defined by you. My experience has been that the term lot and tract and parcel all have been used interchangeably throughout the years. Um, are you proposing to change that? Um, well, we're certainly proposing to change kind of the, well, we're proposing to, to specify that at least in the case of these types of facilities, they could be on a lot or a tract. But in my mind, Paul, and I don't think this is specifically defined in your code, some codes get into more specific definitions. In my mind, a lot is a parcel created by an official subdivision plat, a county approved plat that is contemplated for the kind of the primary development across the proposed subdivision. So if you think of a, of a single family residential subdivision, the lots are gonna be where the single family houses are. Uh, if you think about a, a commercial project uh, with office buildings, the lots are going to be where the office buildings are. Uh, tracks, to me, in most subdivisions, is a more uh, kind of amorphous term that's used to identify parcels that aren't where the primary development is going, but where other things are happening. And they could be parks, they could be open space parcels. They could be uh, utility facilities like detention ponds. Um, they could be areas like medians or, or monument signage parcels. So they're areas that are not the core focus of the development, but that are, that are scattered throughout the project and serve other purposes 
and have other types of uses, not the primary development. Um, and to us, there's room within that idea for a tract, especially in a, in a conventional residential subdivision, to have one tract that may not be eligible for residential development, but they could have some other kind of use on it, particularly a public use, uh, like an emergency services facility, and that there's nothing untoward about that. Uh, it, you know, all these terms are a little bit loose depending on what jurisdiction you're looking at, but that, that was our thinking. And we were, we wanted to create the flexibility to have one of these facilities on something that may not qualify as a lot, but is still attract within the subdivision. So to take that a little bit farther, um, does this proposal then nail down what's a lot and what is a tract? Well, I think that's, that's according to each subdivision. If it's got the word lot in it, it's a lot. If it's got the word tract in it, it's a tract. I mean, you look at a plat and it's gonna tell you, it's gonna, there are gonna be road tracks and, and, and other tracks and they're gonna be lots. Um, and it, the, the, I think the designation comes down to what's on the subdivision plat. So a tract doesn't have to meet the minimum lot size uh, as illuminated in the zone district. Right, and that's very common. I mean, you, you see subdivisions all, all across the place in Colorado and elsewhere where you can have tracks that are, you know, two tenths of an acre because it's a, a median within a road for a like signage, or it might be a, a half an acre tract that's for a detention, a stormwater detention facility. And it doesn't meet the lot, lot size requirements so you couldn't put a house on it, but it's, it's a separate piece of, of land that's separated by some other piece of land by a road or other lots or, you know, it can be, they can be created by different means, but they're kind of all the leftover areas, some more intentional than others, but that's basically what tracks are. So in this particular case, and I'm sorry, Madam Chairman, I might be monopolizing here. Maybe you don't want me to be doing that. Um, but I would say that in essence, you are looking to expand the allowances that a tract have, uh, is generally allowed to have. Certainly. Yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. I mean, it, it's specific to one type of use. And I, I don't know whether there, are, I, I don't know all the things that may be permitted on different tracks, different areas of the county under different circumstances. But when it comes to these facilities, we're, we're definitely making it clear that they could be either on a tract or a lot. And a tract is, by my way of thinking, something that may not meet the minimum lot size requirements. So it, it, may, be, it may be smaller than a lot could be. But to us, since it's a public facility that serves a kind of a public health and safety purpose, that that's a, a worthwhile thing to consider. Um, then um, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of looking at the size of this particular tract that we're talking about. It's 2.1 acres, is that correct? Well, I mean, this isn't technically about the Angel View subdivision, but I think that's the case. Yes, well, I, I think we're looking at it through that lens. I think that the track that we have in mind with an angel view is is just over two acres. And I will, um, but I want to point back, and I think you're aware of this, that the subdivision code doesn't want to see any water and sewer on anything less than two and a half acres. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think what we're talking about here is more zoning code than we are subdivision. But what we're looking at here now is to create a um, less than two and a half acre parcel that you want to put water and sewer on, mm -hmm. or uh, well and septic on. Right. Yeah, with the, with the approval of the county through the conditional use process. And, 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 and uh, I mean, um, Melissa, am I correct that that some consultation with the county engineer was done with the, with respect to the, the yeah. parcel? 
Right. I can add to that because um, Paul, we, I met with Jackie Littlepage specifically about this issue. And under number six of the code amendment under utilities, the, the last sentence ends with um, in accordance with the applicable state regulations. And she specifically wanted us to add that because then her, her interests are protected in terms of the, the uh, on-site wastewater treatment systems, that there will be adequate space um, uh, to, to allow for that. So in, in essence, it, looking at these on a case-by-case -case basis, can a well and a septic be allowed? It will depend on um, that particular proposal, the topography, um, the soils information that you would get from that, but it's possible um, through the, uh, the uh, state regulations to get that done. So that's why it's written that way, Paul. Yeah, I, I see that. And um, I think that that helps take care of it, uh, of that particular circumstance of, of stuffing a well and a septic onto a sub standard lot size, but I, I guess I would um, further comment that my understanding about what a tract is, is something that really isn't available for, well, for inhabited use um, and, and typically hasn't been in the past. And now we're looking to open it up to that. I don't know that that's a bad thing, um, but I'm, I would like to make sure that we all understand that that's what this is potentially doing. I do appreciate the fact that um, this code amendment um, is intended to be countywide and um, it, it does help to allow for um, the applicant to to get a step closer to what it is that he'd like to have in this particular site. But it's hard not to look at this discussion without taking a more global approach. And I think that we're all having trouble with that. So I would just expand on that. And, and, and I think I would just, just one quick point. Um, to everyone to consider that this, this uh, conditional, this use is conditionally available um, currently within um, the RC zone district. So um, not, you know, if, if there is not a readiness and we can't identify a gap um, that we need to fill or a deficiency in the code, um, not moving forward with the code amendment is not reducing a countywide allowance that already exists. Um, so um, I think that's just a good thought to keep in mind as, as we're weighing pros and cons um, as the planning commission and the board are thinking about this. Um, not moving forward with the code amendment is not um, taking away anything from the existing code either. So it is still a conditional allowance um, you know, or a conditional, um, conditionally approvable use within um, all of the zone districts that we're currently talking about. So um, I just think that that's just something to, to put on the radar. Commissioner Much. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, I think, I think kind of circling back and trying to summarize a lot of that again, I think that's, that's where I am having a really hard time understanding the global approach and the global benefit to having the code amendment. And as Mr. Johnson brought up um, first, this you know specifically relates to their interest in a particular subdivision. And I have not really understood or heard where else um, specifically we are trying to improve conditions to meet um, the criteria set where we have identified those gaps. So I, I just, I have a hard time understanding across the county, the benefits right now where, where I think we would 
maybe see this um, come up, um, I guess more site specific or, or we would really have understood a kind of a chronic or ongoing issue and all of us wouldn't be like scratching our heads over the benefit necessarily. Uh, Kelly Sweeney, I saw your hand was raised. Thank you so much. Um, I, I haven't actually had the opportunity to see published what all is written as far as the specifics, but I think that Ann Schneider made an excellent point echoed again by, by Commissioner Mudge that this can already be done under a conditional use permit. And my concern is when you start listing all the specifics that conditions change, times change, and then you have yourself with a code amendment that's outmoded. That it's better to, you know, or uh, not limited to, including but not limited to, which puts you right back to what you already have, which is something that can be done under the conditional use permit. And I would also like to just remind everyone that the current fire services, emergency services, public works building in Twin Lakes does host snowmobiles, ATVs, the greater for the public works, and it has the boat, which might benefit from a new motor rather than a location through locked gates when it could just be taken out of the um, current emergency services building that's located in Twin Lakes Village. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Fiedler. Yeah, thanks. Um, just, I wanted to ask a question for, for clarification. I'm not sure if it's a question to staff or to the applicant, but I, so, so that I, I a question around the timing of needing to make a decision on this request. And as has been noted, I mean, there's the clear linkage to the angel view timing. And I guess my question is, is the, the, does the angel view application process need to have an answer on this to, for that sort of dedication purpose? Or can the dedication have, like, I guess, sorry, I guess the question is like, when does the dedication need to happen? Like, does it have to happen prior to Angel View working through its process, or could it happen, you know, down the road in the future? And, and and to me, that circles back to sort of how urgent it is to move on this amendment process. Um, Jeff, I would probably I, maybe Chris wants to comment a little bit on that too. I think that we have to be real careful to separate these two applications, even though I know it's hard to do that because of their correlation to one another. So, um, but they do remain separate issues. And um, I think regardless of the outcome of those conversations on uh, dedications, this is an amendment that um, I believe the applicant um, for this particular application would seek regardless of the outcomes of that. So I don't think um, that one is dependent on the other. And um, yeah, just, try to encourage us to kind of keep them um, separate. Um, but but I don't believe that one is dependent on the other. That, that was gonna, I would hope, be my response as well. And I think that part of it is uh, Mr. Johnson kind of alluded that the whole reason this somewhat was triggered was based on the angel view development. So I think that's why it's gotten a little bit crossed in terms of what the focus is here, but Anne's correct that the focus needs to be on the code amendment regardless of whether um, Angel View may seek to use it. Okay, thanks. I, it, yes, it is hard to separate these two because uh, this wouldn't be being, this code amendment wouldn't be being applied for um, if it weren't for a circumstance that that uh, Angel View wishes to see addressed. Um, having said that, I'm wondering, Alan, Melissa, or Bart, if, um, if this code amendment were not to proceed, um, what would become of this 2.1 acre tract? It would be, it's, it's already a proposed 
contract within the subdivision and it would probably stay it might be it might be combined with another um and would just be part of the internal trail system and open space land you know basically undeveloped lands um but we'd have to or, or it may not be changed at all and it would just be a separate tract and and maybe it would it would be available if there was a reevaluation of this issue in the future and we would we, and one idea we'd have to discuss this with Alan. One idea is that we would remain committed to dedicating it for a a public facility site if the code were ever to permit it in the future. And we would say, well, we gave it a shot this time around, but the, the land's not going anywhere. We're not going to put a house on it, so we may just commit to make it available in the future if if the, the county reevaluates things. That's an idea. Uh-huh. Thank, thank you. Uh, do I have any other questions or comments from planning commission or county commissioners? I think, you know, one thing I'll say is um, it's it seems very, it, all of it seems a little bit muddy as far as the need and the the cause and the you know and I think that it's it's uh, it's hard to it is hard to separate the two um, developments. But I'll also say that I just I know what Planning Commission and our land use staff have on their plates, and I have a hard time seeing this as a priority, even taking up as much time as it already has um, on something that could or could not come into play or need to come into play in the future. Um, so those are, those are my two, two thoughts. Um, do any of our planning commissioners have anything they'd like to? This Howard, I, um, have to agree with you, uh, wholeheartedly, uh, Heather, um, I think leaving it as a conditional use is a good idea until such time comes up that they really need it. Aaron, go ahead. I don't think it's a problem with the specific like uses or how it's broken down. I'm really struggling with the um, adding uh, tracks in there. I know that they're often sometimes the only open spaces and developments. And I know that, uh, again, the one we're not supposed to tie it to has a different process, but I don't think we understand what reducing that acreage could potentially allow countywide. Um, I think it would allow for, like, um, my brain goes to, well, sustainable and affordable housing usually has, like, the bare minimum of open space, and then a developer deciding to build something on the one tract that's, like, left for some green area. I don't know. I just don't, I don't think we know enough about what reducing and including track sizes could potentially change. Bryce, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, not really. Um, I think you covered a lot of things I agree with, um, especially that we're not really preventing anything like this happening by not passing this code amendment. You know, it would still be available under the CUP. So uh, that to me, I, I kind of agree with your priorities. And if we already have a kind of outlet in the code for any specific oddities or individual cases as they come up through the condition use permit process, then we don't um, necessarily need a new code amendment. So, Anne, at this point, um, do we want to go through the whole process of a if, if planning commission is looking to deny the request at this time, do we want to go through denial or do we want to ask the applicant to withdraw or is there pros and cons to either way, especially if they want to be able to come back in the future? Um, can you give us a little insight there? 
Great, great guidance there, um, Heather. Right, I, I think that um, based on our discussion, um, if the Planning Commission wants to move into a motion, but I think um, allowing the applicant the opportunity to withdraw um, the application, if they would um, feel like they would like an opportunity to revisit it in, in the future, um, that would um, be a, a way to kind of honor the process and the time and energy that's been put into it. So, um, you know, hearing, I think, um, kind of what we're hearing as um, some general thoughts. Um, I think that that would be an opportunity that it would be, um, you know, just a, a nice way to, to uh, be respectful and honor the applicant's time um, in, in submitting the application. So yes, I would um, encourage you to move forward with that prior to making a motion. Um, once we make the motion, um, then we will have to, we'll move forward with taking it to the board. So um, this is kind of that opportunity to be able to withdraw if there's interest in doing so. I think the, I mean, Alan, let me know if you say differently, but I'm, I'll, I'll tell you that I think the writing is pretty clearly on the wall and that uh, I'm not sure it would um, be in any of our interests to have a, a vote here that then requires the Board of County Commissioners to take it up again in a week. Uh, I don't see the outcome being favorable uh, based on what I'm hearing and that withdrawal would allow us to go back and reevaluate things and potentially resubmit in the future at some point. And we could still resubmit with a denial, but um, there may be a cooling off period under the code. Plus we'd be asking the Board of County Commissioners to go through a process in a week and take up time on their agenda that would probably be a waste of time. And so I think it would be probably more efficient for everyone to withdraw the application at this point. I agree, Bart. Okay, we'll uh, take that as applicant has officially withdrawn the application 21, sorry, I don't have it here, 21-24. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. You obviously gave it a lot of careful consideration, which we appreciate all we can ask. And um, we'll decide what it means for here from now. Uh, Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Okay, that'll move us down to item B, which is the backcountry zone final draft. Um, and I know we have some new code language. Well, just the revised code language that Ann sent out for us. Um, Ann, I'll let you kind of take the lead on that. Um, well, I think first, I can't tell you how excited Paul and I are about this. <laughs> we, we feel like... Um, we have created a very um, user-friendly um, code to be able to manage both administratively and for the public to understand, which I think is really important um, as this is such a big code amendment and will have such a large impact. Um, you know, we keep referring to it as the largest code change that we can never see that's ever occurred in Lake County, um, short of maybe the adoption of zoning. So um, we are super excited. The first draft had us jumping around the code, something that Paul brought to my attention. And I think sometimes we get kind of used to that, you know, go to chapter three, now go to chapter six for development standards. And so we get kind of used to that. But when we, um, once we took a, a, a second look at it into the new um, version that you have, allows someone to come in and look at the, the uh, code and find it all within the use specific standards. The licensing um, for a backcountry structure, um, the regulations for um, single family detached um, and the standards that apply to all uh, throughout the zone as well as the site plan review process. So it's all within the use specific standards which they've got one place to go in the code to find the information. Um, it makes uh, for future administration of the code, hopefully very simplistic for uh, to manage. And um, I think so that was uh, really our big goal. Um, I'm having a little problem getting on to um, 
the uh, share drive. So if, if at any point you want to share any of that, or I'm certainly can answer any questions, I do think there is one area of the code that I think Paul and I would like to have just um, make sure that we have fully vetted. Um, and that is the maximum allowable size of a single family detached home. Um, currently, we have that uh, drafted as a no larger than 900 square feet. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we've heard um, the Planning Commission and the board, and, and you know we've heard the comment within the work sessions to make sure that that's, that's where we wanna land. Um, there is a thought that that might be um, a bit restrictive. Uh, 900 square feet is not really big for a single family home. Um, so there's pros and cons to both. One is that the intent of the back country uh, really is to keep it rural and remote um, with a conservation minded construction and a lesser footprint, but at the same time recognizing that that is um, a bit of a, re a considerable reduction. So just want to make sure that uh, kind of hear from everyone what you're thinking about that maximum allowable size for single family detached. And any questions that you have about the draft or um, any comments? I, well, I'd first like state, I think it looks awesome. You guys did a great job. I read it and I agree. It's super user-friendly. Um, so I love that. Um, and I, yeah, I would love to hear, we've gone, I feel like we've gone back and forth on the max square footage um, a bunch. And um, I see the pros and cons with both. I think that I personally still lean to towards giving a little bit more, being closer to like 1100 or something like that, just because I do feel like any opposition we get to this is gonna be what we're taking away from people. Um, and, you know, do I think that there's a really big difference in impact on 1100 or 900 and psychologically 900 sounds really small, even though it's not that much smaller. So those are, that's just my thoughts on that, but I'm also, I think what we have is so great and um, I'm excited for it. So I don't, you know, I still feel fairly confident that if we stay at 900, that, that we would do okay. I, I would like to echo Anne's comment that she and I both are quite excited to get this to legal review because it's in a final enough format. I think that um, it's still gonna require um, amending of, three or four sections of code, and did you recall what that is? In, in any case, go ahead. Um, other than these specific standards, it's just camping and definitions, so. Um, okay, and then adding this um, site specific uh, or this use standard for the backcountry zoning. Um, <clears throat> so, um, Ann and I are really pleased with what we've produced. And we're anxious to get it on to review by uh, legal to see if we're stepping on anything that we shouldn't be stepping on. Um, I, I will tell you that my greatest concern is the, the um, zoning license for a backcountry structure. Um, that, this, that's something that I think is new to us all, that it's not actually being... Um, uh, uh, enforced by the building code. It's, it's something that is a backcountry structure is part-time um, occupation. Uh, and there are some very minimal standards that we're looking for um, in, in its construction, presuming that it doesn't have water or sewer. So um, I, I tend to think that 900 is a little bit small for a single family home. Um, and I think we had originally talked about the single family home being about 1200. And um, I, I would like to consider perhaps going back to that. Planning commissioners, what are your thoughts? Um, you know, just to speak, I think originally I was on board with 1,200 square feet, but through all the conversations we had, I kind of understood why 900 square foot 
stood out and got chosen. Um, it's just, it's in line with the intent of the whole zone district and it is allowing them an option to have a full time year round structure up there. Um, so I like that because it's just kind of, it seemed like a, a middle ground between allowing a family structure or disallowing any sort of permanent structures up there and only allowing that part-time use. So I guess that's all a way of saying, I don't really have any big pre preference between 900 and 1200, um, but I do think the 900 is, if it stays, I have no problem with that. I have a couple more questions after we're done with the building size restriction. I don't wanna get away from that, but I just had a couple more questions about the code. I think it's great. I read through the whole thing and it looks awesome. Mine are just kind of technical details so I can wrap my head around and maybe ask a couple particular questions, but um, yeah, we'll let Erin see if she has any opinions. I was just gonna say, I think personally, I like the intent of the 900, but I totally understand the psychology of 900 versus, you know, a thousand versus eleven hundred. Is it weird to just say a thousand? Is there like a reason we don't say that when we say like we're going nine hundred, eleven hundred, or twelve hundred? Do we just kind of maybe we go a thousand square feet? But I also like again, I really like the intent of the nine hundred. I'm kind of with Bryce. I I understand either side, so I don't know if I'm very very helpful. Um, but I think maybe if it's just kind of the psychology behind it all of numbers and perception and view, you know, putting a one in front might be beneficial. Yeah, I guess that was my one, one for the comment is that is the one point I do expect to get the most pushback from the public on if we leave the 900 in. But not to say that's not we, you know, it's justifiable and it's in in line with everything else we're doing. But I do expect some public pushback. Yeah, again, my house is around six fifty. Like nine hundred is plenty in the middle. <laughs> this Tritz here. I um, <clears throat> I have to uh, compliment all of you that have worked so hard on this. Uh, the not the planning zoning. Uh, 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 people, uh, uh, Paul and Anne, and um, in particular, uh, Heather and Aaron putting together uh, the, this list. I mean, that's been a, a great help to all of us. Thank you very, very much. Um, you know, in the beginning, I said it was back country. It should be not bigger than 600 square feet. Uh, I have uh, I've changed, I uh, went to 900. And I think I'm going to stick with 900. So there we are. Thank you much. Thanks, Howard. How about county commissioners? Do you have any thoughts to weigh in on the size that we're looking at? I I think we could we should stick with the 900. Um, and, and present that and, and you know see what kind of feedback we get from the community. Um, I think it's, uh, I see Kayla pop something in the chat there. She said, I think 900 is appropriate. Um, yeah, that's my thoughts on the side. <laughs> All right, well, it kind of seems like we have a consensus to move forward with a 900, let's keep it. I mean, I think the other thing we can always remember is throughout this process, through public hearing process, it could change if we really feel like there's enough of an argument against it. Um, and or if down the road we have this in place, right? All of this is amendable. So if we go in and we're, we're really seeing that there's some need to up it or down it, we can do that at that point, so. I think this is a great starting point for our code. We'll also have, um, you know, we'll, we'll do, we will have the one town hall meeting. Um, and so maybe if we hear kind of know at that kind of check-in point with the public, if, if boy, that's something that uh, we get, we hear about immediately, then maybe we can rethink it. But we will have that one, um, uh, check-in point of, uh, and, and as soon as I, I, as soon as legal reviews uh, the, the proposed code, um, I'm kind of, I kind of like legal to look at it first, and then I'd love to get it up on the website. So, um, um, yep, and I, I see that we've got some other uh, technical questions uh, just about uh, code and content. So, 
uh, Heather, if, if that sounds good, I, we're happy to take those. Also, um, I think that when Paul forwarded the forms, he also we also created like our administrative um, processing pieces, like the license application and the site plan review checklist. Um, so uh, you, yeah, that was the other part that we had to build into is how are we going to administer this within our department? And so those forms, we're happy to take questions on those too. So. Yeah, thank you, Ann. I was thinking if we want to confirm on the 900, then we can move on to people having questions on the rest of the, the code, drafted code. So everybody feels good with that. Let's um, go in. I know Bryce had a couple of initial thoughts that he brought up uh, or didn't bring up, but. Yeah, it actually looks that. like uh, Commissioner Mudge have, might have some of the same questions. So I might cover something she had too. Uh, mine was about the U the first one I wanted to bring up was in 5.25.27 section E um, about the generators. I just wanted to float it past everybody. I don't know if it's a good idea to require inverter generators. My main concern was just with construction. You know, you know those things are really good for camping use, but they not, might not be powerful enough to power a power saw or something you need in the field. And so I don't want to like, I don't know if it's appropriate to outright ban them in the code. Um, but that's just an idea, just a thought I had. Moving on though, um, mine was about the solar systems and, and utilities. In the, the table of uses, um, solar system, both small and large, take your CUP. And it also says all other utility basic is a conditional use. But um, building a single family dwelling is a use by right. And so I'm just wondering if, I'm just wondering what the scope of that small solar system is, because in section F of 525.27, it also says small scale renewable energy system is encouraged. So I'm just wondering what the scope of the solar system and the utility conditions are, um, and if that would essentially require single family dwellings to go through a conditional use permit process just to meet those, or if I'm misinterpreting and there's, they could still meet their utility needs underneath or without need to go through those conditions. So those, those solar use would be more of a commercial um, use. Um, rough mounted, ground mountain residential use. Um, actually, there's uh, legislation by about the way that we have to process those and, and the fees that we charge. So those would be, again, um, something that we would encourage. And, and those would just be an over-the-counter solar permit. Yeah, yeah, Bryce. Um, we don't require a conditional use permit for for renewable for a, a solar system. And so, would that kind of that all other utility basic would that cover kind of like utility infrastructure essentially? Right. Those um, are those are under a, uh, you know those are more of a commercial and not residential. Um, okay. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Sarah, what are your concerns or your thoughts about electricity and generators? Um, I, I actually hadn't considered or uh, thought about the period of construction versus, you know, utilizing the structure once it's complete, but I think that's a good one. And honestly, I don't, I don't, um, I guess I don't have concern over, you know, temporary use of regular generators. I just wondered about the language in there. Say, stating that generators are discouraged. Um, I, I think I just, I can't help but feel like we still maybe need a little stronger language to like state that generators are, uh, or encouraged for emergency use only as, you know, the, the structures are meant to be uh, primitive and have, alternative, minimal, um, I don't know, utility use. Uh, and also we don't necessarily, do we say, well, I guess some of the solar energy systems, I, I suppose it's inherent in, in stating that, but 
Um, I wonder if, if it's helpful to like mention a battery system or some stored energy. I just, I just don't, I don't, and I, I keep thinking back to like the HUD system and how that works. And um, I just, you know, I've never been or heard of anyone visiting a 10th mountain hut and actually using the generators. I just worry about that. <laughs> Is it worth saying like writing in something that they can't use for prolonged use? Like can't leave your generator on 24 hours a day as your power source? Yeah, or maybe, yeah, maybe it can't be the primary power source and meant to be used in emergency cases only. Um, well, and sorry, I'm, I'm flipping back and forth through Zoom and, and the, the draft. Um, I mean, I might, a generator shouldn't have to be used if there is a solar energy source. You know, the, the two of you are peaking my recollections here and Ann, maybe you can help um, uh, our, our uh, zoning license code does not allow for any fuel fired um, uh, utilities or whatever other than cooking and a generator is going to be fuel fired so we now have just Thank you both, Bryce and Sarah, but we have a little bit of a conflict um, in our proposed code, which is why we're bringing it to you, is to help us discover those things. Well, but didn't we say you could have a fuel, you could, a gen, well, right, a generator would be run on gasoline in the event of emergency, but we do have a propane fuel source for stovetop use. Yes, we do. Right. But if what the, the what the statement actually says, and help me here, where is it? Fuel uh, uh, um, that fuel fuel fired uh, appliances are are restricted to just the uh, cooking equipment. Oh, uh, number eight on five point two point two seven point two. Um, no fuel fired equipment except for removable cooking appliance having portable tanks shall be allowed. Now, if that, we want. That doesn't we, prohibit fire, wood fired. No, so. it doesn't. But this is fuel fired. This is fuel being um, petroleum product fuel. We might need to define that though, because fuels. All right. Yeah, petroleum fuel, fuel fired. I'll yeah. I'll I'll put that in there right or now. Okay, fuel. that says petroleum fuel fired. Right, Does that uh, work. That's the intent. Yes, but now we have the concern about fueling the generator, which we seem to be allowing, but we don't allow to be fuel fired. Which one do you? What? How should we fix that? I think you should add it to that um, number seven. Include that generators with number seven. That'd so heating stoves shall be installed to either manufacturer well, specific. Wait, num number eight, number eight. So in other words, don't say no fuel fired equipment. No, I would say. I would say no fuel fired equipment except for removable cooking appliances, having portable tanks and um, portable generators. I can do that. What does everybody think? I agree. I think that sounds reasonable. And so now we're talking portable generators. Yeah. Should I should I go ahead and and, and and just say simply shall be allowed and uh, portable generators? Yes. Okay. Sorry, I'm having I can't get on to uh, any files. <laughs> oh, it's okay, Ann. Okay. 
So bringing, bringing a generator up there and um, keeping it up there full time um, is not consistent with the, um, well, it, it's not consistent with that yet because in 27E, it says generators shall be placed in a fully enclosed four-sided storage structure um, that minimizes noise impacts. I, you know, if I were um, looking to have something like this up there, I think that there's a chance that I might like to bring a generator up there um, and not actually have it be portable. Well, the only thing too that 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 actually brings up too is we need to make sure that those um, if they're enclosed that they're properly vented. Um, actually, just thought of that as as we read that being in an enclosed structure, so some of them have to be properly vented to be able to be inside an enclosed structure. Okay, so a four sided storage structure um, that is properly vented uh, to minimize noise impacts. Right, right. And, and so the license and the other requirement for a removable portable um, tanks was again, the temporary nature of, of the presence of it. Although we've kind of gone back and forth on that a bit. Um, and then, um, but it wasn't ever meant to exclude um, generators. Oh, it, in let you know, but but certainly open to that conversation. I think, I guess my thought what when we talked about this before, and this was with people who had far more knowledge about generators and how much noise they make than I do, but um, I didn't think we necessarily like specified that it had to be an inverter generator, but just that we had um, a decibel level that we didn't want exceeded. Um, and so I guess to, to the construction part and or the use part, I guess my question is, if it's just the noise that we're worried about, people using generators, do we really care if they're using them more often than not if the noise isn't an issue, if we just put in a decibel level or do we want, I mean, we're, we're it makes more sense for somebody to put in solar anyway, but is there another reason that we want to say no generators unless it's an emergency use or is it if it's if it's mostly noise that we're concerned about then i guess i would argue that especially on most of these parcels being as big as they are and or away from others i guess i would argue whether we need to split hairs on this and or just put in a decibel level instead of what kind of generator they're using Right, my understanding, this was an edit that I missed um, that Paul had highlighted for me that, that there was a discussion on um, them needing to be inverter, but maybe that um, was just a little premature in the discussion. And because I know that we'd also had the conversation about what are we, you know, we're trying to have noise mitigation is the overall concern. Um, so maybe the decibel level is the manner by which to, like you say, how they're properly mitigate the negative impact. Or, or you know, like at Sarah's point, you know, uh, it may be that we need to specify that they're on an emergency basis, although it will be a little bit, I think that the, the noise, the decibel level might be an e a little bit easier to do you want a compliance basis, like discouraging them and having a threshold might be an easier compliance than have make, you know, having somebody um, determine what their emergency threshold is, but, but that's just a talking point. I think that's my main concern with calling it emergency use. Is I'm how just wondering if there can be some sort of time limit put in there, because I think and this is just personally, but nothing makes me more mad to go out of the woods and someone has their generator on all night on their RV. Yeah. Oh. Well, and wildlife too, disruption, not just for human, like disruption. And I just, I mean, there's gonna be a variance and not everyone's gonna comply with this 
to the letter that we're writing and I'm trying to figure out which one sends the better message of like, you know, this really shouldn't be, I mean, maybe we could put both in there. Like this is for emergency use only and our concern here is for um, the noise pollution that it creates for both uh, nature and human interaction. I would love to take a stab at kind of re-wordsmithing this of, um, you know, noise pollution is um, excessive or something about being prohibited and, and, and based on that, here are guidelines, you know, like something that focuses more on um, no tolerance for noise pollution and, and, and here are the guidelines for being consistent with that. I think that's a, a reasonable thing for us to attempt to do rather than wordsmith it here and now, let's, let's take a chance and, and we can then forward it on to you over the next couple of days, what we come up with. I like it. Okay. Any um, other, any other comments or concerns about this? I thought it was very clear and easy to follow and um, really well done. I am really glad to hear you say that. Yeah, thank you guys. This was a lot of effort and I appreciate it. It's great. It reads really well. Um, Anne put together an application form for it um, and she put it together a checklist and I looked those over and I couldn't see to change anything. Cool. Well, it's it's not going to be um, advertised anytime soon, but um, I think we'd like to get to a point where legal has weighed in on on this, um, and then I think we want to start talking about advertising it. I also uh, we did get a a cost estimate on using One Touch. Um, to help do the mailings. And so I'm gonna forward that to everyone. We just kind of got a ballpark. It's it's about, I think it's about $1,200 um, to, to do the mailing. And that included various different, you know, if that's one page or if that's two pages, if it's up to four colors. So we, we got kind of a breakdown of some different options and I'm going to email over to everyone. Um, I don't wanna misspeak, but I think Paul and I feel like we have it within the uh, our, the building and land use budget to to take that on. Um, you're not you're not misspeaking. Okay, um, so we do we have that piece as well, and I love the um, draft that came over um, that Heather and Aaron did. I think that's exactly um, you know what we're looking for is a good quick hitting the high points. Uh, informational is pointing to more in-depth information on the website. Um, our new team member, and I see that he's on here and I told him, I already warned him that I was going to put him on the spot. So he's already been told, but John, um, that our new um, team member in building and land use, John Castillo, um, is our um, newest hire and he uh, has amazing um, IT skills. And so I really think that he's going to help us with our website content and helping us kind of draft that and bring something um, to everyone. I, um, and that kind of brings up a exciting and um, exciting for Erin. We want to wish her well in her new endeavors, but I knew, know Erin, your time with us might be getting a little limited as you start your new journey. And so I just wanted to let you know that we do have um, some uh, added capacity in the department and uh, with John. Um, and so I think he'll be able to help us on, on some of that and, and get out an idea of what we can make that look like um, as our web presence. I mean, yeah, I'm, and I'm totally happy to help with this side of it too. Like I can't vote on it, which is 
really, really sad. <laughs> um, but I can at least help with the marketing stuff. And I mean, I will literally be back at work within like a week and a half. Um, so I'll just be remote. So yeah, but I'm totally happy to help. It's not, I wouldn't offer if I didn't know I could keep doing it on this back end side. So we use, if, if I'm allowed to, I don't know if that actually crosses into anything. Um, but in terms of documents and stuff, I know I can't necessarily join all the meetings, but I'd love to be support if I can. Thank you, Erin. We're really sad to lose you. We appreciate your help. But yeah, I think we're allowed to have volunteers help us with any of this marketing slash getting ready, preparing all of the pieces. So should be no problem. It's really weird. I feel very weird. <laughs> Right now. So the um, Bryce, if, are you looking at the um, picture that I think Heather put up? Are well, so this is just it? the flyer that I sent out um, right. that Aaron and I had started working on. So if you hold right there, I'd like to ask Bryce, you know how up north on Highway 91, we just went ahead and crossed over Highway 91 with the zone district. Nod or do something. Yeah, yeah yes, I do. <laughs> um, how about doing the same thing there at Turquoise Lake? Sure. You mean just make... crossing the lake? Sure. Who's going to build in the lake? Yeah, no, and that well, makes no it really simple it... um, legal wise because then you're just fully within the townships. I suppose I just feel like it's easy to like it's such a landmark it's easy to read this map with the lake in it <laughs> that would be actually, my only argument actually that that's a very good point mm -hmm. I, I didn't think of that um never mind <laughs> so some things that I wanted to and we don't have to go through this all tonight but um we just kind of copied and pasted. We got some, you know, like obviously some typo edits and stuff to do, but um, just copied and pasted like our reason for doing um, the backcountry here. What I really want to expand on is this section to make sure that we're making this as nice and clear as they just made our code amendment um, look. So if it's just It'd be so nice if this document could answer almost everybody's questions right off the bat. Um, so I feel like I've been in this for so long that I can't necessarily think of what the questions are. And so it's great to have everybody else's sets of eyes. So the wills and will nots here. And then on the back side with the FAQ, like if we need to change this verbiage or we need to add it like, hey, this is a really important question people are going to continuously ask. If you guys can look at this and then Aaron or I with your suggestions of, hey, I think we really need to have a question in there about this. Like we can make all this print smaller and fit lots of questions in here if we need to or uh, whatever. Um, I just feel like, like I said, I think the goal with this document would be that it answers most questions we can identify that are going to be out there so that the town hall is you know a little less stressful and, a, and everybody comes in a little bit educated and then also this same information would be put on by put on the website so um, those are kind of I think our thoughts and if Aaron has anything else to add but I think that's kind of what we were thinking is and Aaron added a lot of these in here which are great so if you guys think of additional questions or rewording of some of these or anything like that, please don't hesitate to send us edits so that we can get this flyer finished up as well. Because I think then we're pretty close to set. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, are you intending this to be the part and parcel of the notice that we want to put out? Yes. Okay, so we should probably include a let's see a town hall hall date yeah. on here as well we as thinking, yeah we would do something in here um with that yeah. we just yeah and then also when we're actually going to do the um the hearing yeah there it is public meeting day month time and when it, it will it be easier to like have all the text um and that we want included because then we can like format accordingly yeah uh, so like definitely don't limit yourself based on how this is formatted right now 
Um, and I just kind of, again, I, I really just kind of filled the frequently asked questions like with what I had been curious about as we were going. Um, by no means is this a be all end all. So definitely um, let us know what you need or want or what else we so, can do. So we can still use your email, right? Okay. All right. Anne and I will look at this closely and see if we come up with anything else. Because I have to admit, I, ha I, I glanced at it, but I didn't do anything else. Okay. Um, no, and this kind of stuff, I'm, I'm really happy to help with. Um, well, thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. You are going to be missed. For sure. <laughs> close in a week so I don't know what's happening well we wish you the best and we will miss you yeah but you're not gone right not not gone yet yeah moving to me <laughs> yeah She's moving out of the chat. where are you with me then? I'm moving to Maine I oh. get ahead health wise like healthcare wise and the market's crazy, so um, I was able to sell, and my cousin lives out there, and I was able to buy a like really cute little three bed one bath, like on a lot twice the size I have now. And cool. No, uh, can I come? We're in Maine, if I can ask. Yeah, of course, I'm going up to Waterville. So oh, yeah, nice. Uh, okay. Yeah, my aunt and uncle have a lake house there too, so a little spoiled. Yeah. So, um. Super weird. It happened like overnight. I honestly thought I'd die here. So it's it's been a very weird, very weird summer. Well, congrats. So everything is working out. Is that right? So far, nothing's closed yet, but so far. <laughs> I'm 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 very glad. I know you've had some trials and I'm I'm glad things are working out. Thank you. And I can't thank you guys enough. I'm sorry to one, take up some time right now, but two, to also be leaving. I, again, this wasn't on the plan. I wouldn't have joined if I thought so. So I appreciate you guys being so kind about it. Good luck. Of course. Let me, I can't wait to, uh, hopefully you keep me involved in the marketing stuff and then I can find out when you guys vote on it. Uh, Count on it. Yep, for sure. Um, I have one other thing before we um, adjourn tonight. I don't know if it's posted yet, but I, there was one thing I wanted to ask. Uh, we sent out an email, and there's been um, an ask by the city to host a joint work session about some kind of mutual um, priorities and goals. And so we had tentatively uh, wondered if the next regular meeting would be um, a good time to do that. And so I just kind of wanted to see if if we should move forward with putting that agenda together and kind of get some um, guidance. Thank you, Ann. That completely slipped my mind. So that would be October 11th. A work session um, with the City Planning Commission. Would that be, did they, are they able to, they're able to join our meeting? Sorry, I didn't. Well, yeah. Okay. I, I would think that we'd just give them our Zoom info and we can do it all on Zoom. Yeah, I just wasn't clear if that's what they were asking was to join our meeting or set a separate meeting that all of us could attend. That, so I just wasn't sure if we already checked in on that October 11th date for them. I just know that they have, you know, it, it would depend on like, when is their city count? Like, are they going to have three meetings in a row? Because I feel like, don't they have planning and zoning one run at night and then city council another night or something? Yeah. Or they have like two. Yeah, Sarah definitely. Sarah probably knows um, how that works. Yeah, I think so, they have their, their council meetings on the first, well, I want to say first and third weeks. It's opposite. It's, it's similar to us. But I feel like it's opposite of <laughs> the planning. Their planning commissions are first and third, and their council meetings are second and fourth. And their planning commissions start at like six, I think, or they used to. I'm not sure if those have changed. So I guess maybe 
what I would suggest is we could offer up the 11th if they want to come to ours, but I also don't necessarily want to be perceived as you guys make the extra meeting on your schedule and we aren't going to do that on our schedule. So I guess if the, if it would be better to doodle poll people and figure it out that way, um, if they don't want to do the October 11th day, I don't know. I just want to be a little bit cognizant of that. I did respond to Gabby on Friday that our regular meeting for the second, fourth Monday is at four. Um, and with Heather, your concurrence, how about October 11th? And I have not heard back. So we can push for that. Right, we, we can, um, happy to reach out to Gabby and, and just uh, communicate exactly what you just said, Heather, that you know we're happy to look for other opportunities. This, this date would work for us, but um, certainly don't wanna presume that um, you know, having to meet our schedule is, is uh, necessary and we'd entertain conversations um, because certainly look forward to, to putting that together. So yeah, exactly. So I, I think we can include the Board of County Commissioners in on this work session, can we not? I guess. Absolutely. Uh, yes, and <laughs> for those of us planning commissioners that are left, um, can everybody perhaps meet at a, at a six o'clock on a Tuesday or maybe a Wednesday whenever they meet. I can't remember when that is. I mean, it would all just depend on when it is <laughs> before I could answer that question, unfortunately. I think that's where, like, and talking to them and getting an idea of, hey, it's going to be better for our group if we meet at least five o'clock or later, then we know let's look at dates that work for everybody five o'clock or, you know what I mean? I just think that otherwise we're just making a lot of presumptions and not a lot of information. Yes. So we'll try and work on that early this week with Gabby and we'll and do all in. Just one more thing Sarah mentioned in the chat, but I did, I forgot Sarah, but I do want to give it, a, have a chance to present a new mapping product that I've created for the city, LLC, EDC, and kind of our planning commission use. Um, so I want to present that to walk it through because it's kind of advanced or there's a lot of different parts um, going on with it. So it'd be cool to give you guys the lowdown on infrastructure and, um, you know, the availability and accessibility of different parcels to be able to be developed in this county. So that's oh, what I've been working excited. on. Yeah, it's yeah, actually, actually I can send you the link early, Heather, if you want to look at it. It's just that, that I noticed great. that it was, it's better with some, um, description too so yeah do you think you might just be able to forward the email that you sent to the few of us and send that forward that email to the all of us absolutely i'll just do that right now cool that's so cool yeah that sounds awesome i'm really excited yeah because he's got an explanation in there about hamburgers that i think are, is is germane to the issue well it's a, it's a very uh, fancy gis term you know so you yeah. <laughs> love those so. <laughs> All right, well, I'll send that along. Um, but yeah, it just kind of shows some, it's the, the way to describe it is that the layer that's on by default is just an example. So open up the layers and start clicking on and off layers to get an idea of what different analysis there is out there. So. Yeah, include Aaron. Something, on that. I will. Something yeah. that you can, that you're looking to have part of our like joint meeting as far yes, as I, mean, I, was, okay, cool. I think it'd be great to present to the city as well. It's more yeah. county focused, but I mean, any leader in the community that's involved in planning should see it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, then we should probably give you um, Gabby Voller's um, email as well and, and Scott Bauer. So Please, you can send it to them. Can, yeah. I can get that for you. Okay. Yeah, we can include it on like whatever agenda we do for okay. the joint. It's like October 13th is out though. What time is that, Sarah? That will be from six to eight, the Community Wildfire Protection Plan community meeting okay. on Wednesday evening. Okay, long meeting, got a lot done. Yeah, it's exciting stuff. Um, yeah, go ahead. 
Go ahead, Erin. <laughs> Abby and Luke, I say bye. Yeah. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks, Aaron. Do you want to be our motioner for adjournment? Sure. Make your last motion. <laughs> <laughs> um, I make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor. Bye. bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Thank guys. You all. Good night. All right. Talk soon. Take care.